Thank you. Um, sorry. It is a joy. So, um, yeah, what I mean by a little bit of capital P, <laughs> just like to open your table. Some people are named pioneers, they're ordained as pioneers, others operate as a pioneer regardless of the designation. So I am not technically ordained as a pioneer. I did not go through a pioneer panel or anything like that, but I have been operating in that. And um, yeah, for about 20 years and as a lay person and now having turned my collar around. So it really is drawing on like that experience that I really wanted to talk and um, with you and share with you today. And um, in some common themes have emerged across the variety of contexts um, that I spoke of um, and everything in between. So it touches, I think, on a number of things that have already been expressed within the conference, perhaps most notably um, the role of new things alongside established, emerged forms of work and practice. It touches on like commonality in worship um, and probably on a sort of binary false dichotomy between the serve first and a worship first model that I have experienced. Perhaps most fundamentally though, what I sort of want to challenge in like this very short time together is the perception of neutrality and really interrogate um, more fully the espoused theology that we have and that we share with each other against the operant forms that we actually experience in context. So, um, in all the pioneering of planting across the last 20 years, it's all the new things um, that I was you know, involved in in my other life, but also from childhood. Um, I suppose what I want to frame in this time together is some of the sort of theological context that we've been slightly unpacking in the rest of the conference, exploring some of the ways in which the sort of principles collide in praxis and context before closing with what I hope in the moment of practice. So, as we explore new things with people and in place, um, we, we're aware of the criticisms, aren't we? There are myriad criticisms that were up there in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament early church that we see played out today. What, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You don't count if you do it this way. It's not proper. It, la, 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 la. Like, you can fill in all your blanks. You will have your own. Someone might be like, some of them might be historic. <laughs> However, it is not a new thing to be debating who counts, who doesn't. What constitutes proper practice and where does it come from in our theology? These are not new questions. So um, some of these things are about the role of tradition. Um, some of them are about the lowest common bar, you know, in like what is commonality and its lowest denominator. And um, some of them are about liturgy and sacramentality and their role in what we do together and how we do it. But in prioritising the beginning of new things, communities, congregations, gatherings, embodied forms, whatever we want to refer to them as, we make choices in how we do what we do. Very explicit choices. And a lot of them are unconscious choices. They are because of how we are formed in what we have done. And what yeah we have a sort of curated along our journey and experience and have a huge impact therefore on what we establish together now worship is a participatory endeavor we know that full well simultaneously weaving multiple directions between person in all the directions between people in the incorporated body articulated together in time and place and story in our encounter and reach for the divine. So, there has been much written on models of engagement. We have programmes, community development, welcome, style, tradition, their role, their standing in establishing new things, in shaping place. Our role states very clearly, I suppose, and I suppose the things that came out of the research that Will presented to us in the shaping of new things, in the establishment of new things. The role of imagination, of vision, is not a work of ours, clearly. We had, you know, it says in the very earliest pages, and like, my father had it in his heart to plant a house for them. It is an ultimately participatory thing to imagine and to create and to renew. But shaping place clearly states the role of imagination, what it terms as theological imaginary is beyond the thing that we do. The outworking is based on image, story, metaphor. They, they are the finals of what we do. 
what does this mean that we need? So perhaps reshaping what we espouse has a huge impact potentially for how we operate in place. So our modes of participation in community development have been like written a lot. And I know Bishop Eleanor touched on them. I know Al Barrett's work came up um, before in terms of, you know, we've got various models and modes and ways of framing things. Um, and I suppose I want to say that we have so many because none of them have found a complete answer. And that might seem obvious, but actually it's important to maybe draw on them in a broad view rather than in their specifics when we look at interrogating what this means. Because before I expand on the nature of we are perfectly fine in our places of hosting today out of post of whatever it is that we do in the face of cultural atheism. Or they're like, you are welcome, please come and join in with the thing that we have come to do together. You are welcome to learn what we do and join in to the end where, wow, God is like clearly doing something. I don't know if you recognise that that is God's work, the work of the Spirit in recreating, but like, I want to be shaped by you as you might be by us. Before we unpack them in reality, I suppose, I want to say that it's ultimately about what influence we hope it has. I think a base question is what is the influence, what is our inherited assumption of influence, often from a place that we have something that we need. We are looking at the gaps, the problems, and looking to address them in need or morality. And actually, I think what I want to say is that I'm arguing against that. I see so much of the work of the Spirit from people who are not the best faith in the person of Jesus Christ. I see so much justice and compassion and need and advocacy, whether they name him or not, that is who I am met with in the people that I meet outside the church as well as the time we live in. So, um, I suppose our influence on what we inhabit then is limited often to an expression of form. It becomes like a transactional channel of experience that we have come to sort of inhabit to structure our encounter, to facilitate our encounter. And actually, I would like to say therefore that it is not a mutual act in the fullness of what I mean by the term mutual. An example, it might be a shallow example. I am hypermobile from many, many years of dance. When I was expecting my second child, my eldest would hold her hips and groan outwardly as she stood every single time. Now, my three year old did not have hip dysplasia. She was imitating mine. And I offer that to you, it might be a shallow example, but I think we find other examples. My part of my family are Roman Catholic, so visiting my grandmother's church, I absolutely crossed myself with holy water where I entered because that's what they did. I have no understanding of why I was doing that. What was created in this moment of encounter is I even recognised that it was had the potential for encounter, that that was its purpose. I don't think I did. So Bear with me, because these are important things, and they might be shallow illustrations, and in some ways they are intended to be so, because we cannot rely on the church doing the thing that we do together to reach generations or keep generations. I think that our, like, our current report, the current place that we find ourselves in, is testament enough to that. I don't think I need to like go to explain that further. We cannot escape that worship shapes us. Yes, we are created, we are creatures, created in the divine image of God, bearing that image to the world in the fullness of all that is, but we are also curated in our experience. And that is in our life experience, it's in our church experience, it's in the rich heritage of tradition that we sort of dip and weave, I don't know about you, but I've dipped and weaved throughout many different things that have formed me, whether I recognise their influence on me at the time or not. And I think, therefore, in my work in planting and pioneering, I have been very much confronted with some of these things that have formed me and therefore given me assumptions of what I carry into my practice. They have given me a sort of formational imperative, if you want, or a certitude that I have then tried to place on others. 
And that has been a huge learning and a thought, a huge change probably over the years that I've been doing this. Not recognising the self with the other in the mind. And so really, in as much as we are shaped and hope to shape, I suppose through these years of tradition and the importance of form and a very allied um, understanding of what that means in our practice, what we have come to do, I believe, is have a very under-realised sense of what neutrality actually is. We have a really under-realised sense of what neutrality actually is. It's still based on the thing that I hope to impart, that you can learn to grow into. Now, in some ways, this is formation, but I think it's a really shallow adaptation of participation that we are called to. Through the work of the Spirit, in union with the Father, through the person of the Son. That is the foundation of all theological commandments. Now, the question is how we hope to form influence in and what impact we hope to have on community in collaboration with what God is already doing. Recreating some things, starting new things in the move to renew and restore, to reconcile all things. Now, growing up in a church with a deaf and deaf blind, it's part of my to this a lot, and I move, and I grew up signing. So I grew up seeing the voices giving glory up, like in the deaf choir, at the same time as I heard them in Hebrews. The deaf church cannot hold a microphone, they cannot hold a book, they cannot look at both the interpreter and the liturgy that is literally being encountered before them as bread and wine are going to be in our worship together, we were entirely bought by the people who we got and we get to. They were the principal source. How was God working in them? I will never forget a man, good man, who came rolling up a hall and he said, Helen, 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 who was a chapter at the time, like God knows that I'm deaf, and he showed me in the kitchen. This man was in his 60s and he's gone his whole life trying to be hearing in order to accept the gospel that we thought we had the privilege of sharing. God showed me in pictures. Again, I had 11 people in a totally different context in a pit village who, like the children of be 9 or 15, who came forward as candidates for confirmation. Incredible. Four of them could not write their name. And we were presented with a course handbook. And then asked them to stand with the bishop and say, I rebuke, I renounce, I repent. What does that mean? As a like 40 year old woman who was, you know, a graduate and all the other bits and pieces, I have to spend time unpacking what that means. It is not in a lexicon or language. It's not accessible, it's not appropriate. How would it be instead to reshape our liturgy around image, for image, for images? through which we explore the reality of God's encounter and transformation in that young person's life in a way that they can then be fully participating in expressing fully, not assimilating the thing that we have presented as the appropriate form for the standing. Now, I'm saying this, and I know, I know that it's difficult, and I know that I stand here, perhaps paradoxically, with a colour on as a stipendary minister in the Church of England with all of its historic formularies, but I offer it to you because actually I think the research that we have is orientating us, the work of God in our place is orientating us to a different mode of operating. So where we espouse is actually operant. Where we begin to realise more fully what we mean by the neutrality. It's interesting, perhaps, that recent YouGov, YouGov stats state that 80% of the church England graduates. 80%. It is also then interesting that 67% would describe themselves as middle class. Now, how much then is our form self-selecting membership of a club? Of a way of doing? I am a creative person. I have a hearing loss. I work in visual images and doing and dancing and expressing physically. And yet in church, I am 
forced to operate in an only cognitive, receptive, and verbal response. Now I am articulate, I have learned to grow in sort of that having a language of how to express. However, that would not be my primary thought. And I don't see a lot of space for that in the context of our usual gatherings. And when I do, it's normally aimed at engaging with children rather than people. Now, the rich young ruler, when he asks the question, she says, what must I do to bring up eternal life? What is the thing I've done like this? I'm upright, I'm moral, I've kept all the laws. Like, what is the thing that I must do? Jesus says, you lack one thing. You need to be prepared to give up everything. Which is a sharp, perhaps, accusation of the church in England in this context. The rich and the goes were sad. The church I'm in, in parts, feels very sad at the cost of what they're being asked to endow. Now, within that, the readings on Sunday where unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there will be no grain. Us. <laughs> we have to die. To die. I love our tradition. I love our heritage. But I want to say we need to operate with different imaginaries. Imaginaries that are not about the thing that we do. The thing being the thing. A Christianity that is born through imitation and people learning to adopt the thing that we do. But it's actually shaped fully by the personhood that they bring. We've had 30 women to the ordination of women to the priesthood. They don't bring their gender. They bring themselves in the fullness of themselves in the same way that any man, any deaf person, any child offers themselves. And encounters the divine in their self-same offering. And in them. Now, my experience, as I said earlier, is that the outworkings of this, this hope, this heart, the community of place, are often born out in the language of outreach, which, if we go back to our models, still to me implies a doing to. It doesn't matter how much you want to go and be with, to, you know, to do to, to be with, or to meet needs, to build a relationship and have conversations so that people will come to. It is still one direction, primarily in one direction. It still operates in one part of the what I'm, I suppose, articulating in this time is that actually I've stopped talking about what our outreach is and I've started talking to my team and congregation about what it is to make space for the in-reaching of our community. How are you going to let your community in-reach you? That requires us different things. We are in the position then of receiving the work that God is already doing in the work that is bubbling up in the hearts of the people who in reach us for his glory and the coming of his kingdom. So, my experience, as I said, is that I've learned more about God's grace, God's love, God's justice, often from people outside the church as well as within. It is clear that God's spirit operates in the whole of creation, whether or not he is recognised at the time, and hindsight tells me that I have missed many an opportunity for God's encounter and worship. It's only looking back and having somebody ask me that I see it fresh for you. So I suppose in all of this, and with the other things that we've heard from the conference, Bishop, Bishop Eleanor talking about the of power of community development, not from a thing of like, where's the gaps? What can we fill? What do you need? But from a what is the riches that you bring? It's an asset based posture. Alan, really powerfully sharing, really, really powerfully sharing on this and like what it means to recognize the work of God between, in, through, in your community, in your culture, in your sorrows, in your joys, where He is the best or not. Where do we have eyes to see? He needs to hear, hands to serve all the things. Because 
the influence of the divine on the church body and participation in all the joys and challenges that we have in our curating life's experience is not actually about us outreaching us. It is a different Trinitarian posture. It requires of us different things. And so we are as much shaped, I have been as much shaped in my ministries, I suppose, and my practice, and the practice of the class, and by those communities that I've been privileged to join with for a season, as they have shaped. They have shaped me as much as I have been privileged to share. Now, what does this fully realised neutrality mean for us? Well, I think I've said it already. Worship faith is, um, in my previous post, the new leader of Richard here. <laughs> um, all the things, it's like actually people bought our, our worship space was curated from the things that people bought, the objects that told of their story with God and God's character, their encounter. It was born out of things like conquerors, seagrass, daily maps, bicycle reflectors, broken light bulbs, time charts. That's both a terminal diagnosis. It was a profound living witness of thing and object and the reality of everyday life that spoke of God and God's people together in school. What else might it mean? It means people being able to give fully of themselves, regardless of their language, their background, how they choose to inhabit, their learning style, their action style, or whatever fad or you know, bit of research we're doing at the time. And that means you're making room for their whole self, as they are, as they choose to share it with you. In practice, this looks like things like Zumba growing into praise size, with like a meditation and worship at the end, during the long term. This looks like karaoke after the community crowd. It looks like an investment in a cathedral and beanbags. And so he back. It looked like ending in the crypt in the burial, with Jesus laid out in a shroud on Good Friday, and with a candle at both ends, while the lamentations of Jeremiah spilled over. It looked like the one that they pierced and wept, and people were stood at that doorway, looking into that space, compelled and utterly repelled, drawn forward and unable to bear the intimacy of that moment. How do we hold space for those moments? We can veil their God and meet them and draw us all together. So there are strong questions on us, and I'm still wrestling with some of these things. Because actually, we're in a new heritage tradition that is wonderful and glorious and has so many influences from which to borrow from. But actually, unlocking the imagination of how they are lived out in time and place in a new way requires different things of its vocations, cafe, different things of its directors, a different things of its structured and resources, a different things of the academy can train us. There are quite different disciplines and instincts and things. And I suppose, in closing, the thing that I wrestle with most is changing and bringing the people. No, so we do not want people to go, we do not want to lose people, we do not want people to be sad, we do not we want people to be angelic because we were always a church of mission. But actually, in reshaping, the people that we have together so that we gather in the presence of God as the people of God. We then gather around the story of God and story by him in his giant story of redemption. Before we gather around the table, his table, and we are then sent to gather in the temple. Our meeting was never about us. It was never really about us. And so I suppose, what would it mean in your places to have a more realised sense of neutrality in the fullness of the cups, challenge and opportunity?